dry, dusty and hot and the perfect conditions to head down to one's local waterhole for a swim and a drink. This is Safari Live. We chat as well. We'll be able to go through as many questions as possible this afternoon and also if you just want to say hello from wherever you're watching. But this is a wonderful rare occurrence. We don't often see Batelier eagles down on the ground and in close proximity to us. They're generally a little bit flighty and will try and get away from where we are. So to have one coming right to the edge of the water and drinking is very special. So hopefully it's going to drink. I think we disturbed it a little bit when we arrived at Treehouse Dam. So it's just we're wondering how it's going to sort of approach the water and making sure that we're not a threat but look at the beautiful color and detail in those feathers like I say it's not often that we get close enough that we can see all the detail but you can see those little white edges to it and cream edges and those colors are all going to change later in life and is he gonna go drink I think so looks like it how wonderful is this to see a Batelier eagle so up close that we can actually then watch it drink. This is not very common at all for us. In fact, in my entire time at Safari Live, this is the first time that I've seen a Batelier eagle drinking or that we've got on camera. Seb, have you ever filmed one, filmed one drinking? No, it's not a common thing at all. So it is very cool to see and it's because of how hot it is I was saying just now that it is hot and it feels like the oven doors have been left open and it's about a hundred degrees Fahrenheit 98 to be exact and 33 I mean 36 degrees Celsius so it is excessively warm out here and there is this warm wind blowing as well and it really does feel quite stifling so if you're a bird of prey with a thick feathery sort of body it must be quite nice to come down and get this cooler water from the edge of Trias Dam and you'll be surprised how cool that water actually is even in hot weather like this because it's quite a large body of water it takes some time to warm up and so that water will be nice and refreshing for a very hot bird you'll see every now and then it, that it does actually open its mouth and pant a little bit I want maybe if it's going to be a better idea Seb, let's, Seb, let's try, although it's going to be quite far. I was thinking if we go around, we might get a little bit more eye level, and if it drinks, we'll get it head on as it begins to drink, which would be quite cool. There's the odd go-away bird that's also making a bit of noise. Don't chase our Batelier eagle away, go-away bird. I'll be very upset. And the Batelier eagle is trying to work out where exactly is best to drink from. You can see it's trying to drink from that smallish section of water that's protected a little bit by mud close towards its sort of feet because it doesn't want to get too deep into that water in case there are crocodiles in pans like this it will know that there can potentially be threats and so that's why it will try and stay away from the water's edge and try and find a little puddle somewhere where that it can drink rather than going into the actual water hole in places where you find these small little puddles they will actually wade right into their to their feathers and their feet will get wet as they then drink because they know that they don't have to worry about predators as much you can see look at that massive eye a bit of yellowing coming through on the beak so that will be eventually bright bright yellow and a bit of red will also come through as well on the face so it's going to change quite a bit from what it is now but these are the most awesome views of a Batelier eagle that I've had in a very long time you can see the wind ruffling its feathers a little bit and that wind is so welcome as well because it is like I say stiflingly warm so the breeze at least is providing some sort of relief from what's going on oh, I wonder are you going to go forward for us come on looks like it wants to drink there we go I always love watching eagles walk they don't have nearly as much grace walking as they do flying and they look a bit awkward when they walk they kind of waddle much like penguins Wendy you say what a stunning bird well Wendy we're being spoiled by being able to see this look there we go you see how they have to open their beak quite wide and scoop the water look there we go how cool is that that's very 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 epic it's not something you're gonna see every day I know it's just a bird drinking water but it is a very cool way to see it drink these birds of prey with these big beaks that you see how wide they have to open their mouth just to scoop enough water in to actually quench their thirst it is quite incredible there we go imagine it would take quite a while to scoop in that much water each little beakful is only going to be a few droplets but it will still help nonetheless and I'm sure we'll see this bird drinking for quite some time before it actually satisfies that thirst 
McGregor, where the birds are not impressed though by the battaliers approach and that it's here at the water hole they wanted to probably come down and drink and a bird of prey is always a threat even though battaliers don't hunt birds they still will see this large predatory bird and be a bit nervous of it I wonder if we can get round to the front side of that bird should we try Seb? we're going to just try and see if we can get round to the other side of Treehouse Dam and see if we can get a view of this bird drinking from the front because it will be so nice to have its beak kind of facing towards us and watch the droplets falling out of its mouth as it drinks. I don't think if it didn't fly away when we came around the corner it should be okay for us to get around and get a little bit more eye level to it. It will definitely make for some compelling viewing that's for sure. Hello Wanderer you asking how often would a bird like this need to drink every day so you'll find birds need require water every day and these eagles do drink a lot during the middle parts of the day but because we're not really around at those times we very seldom actually see it so it's nice that we've caught this bird drinking as also because of this excessive heat it's not getting moisture from only its prey items remember lions and leopards will also get moisture from prey items and so will the eagles it's particularly battaliers because they will scavenge or fairly fresh carcasses that still have some blood in them so Seb I'm hoping from here is going to be really nice it looks like it's going to stay for us and this is going to be exactly where I want to be because it is the perfect place to see it drinking now don't go away no Egyptian geese you stay still because the Egyptian geese have just given it a little fright by fluttering across the, the water hole but there we go it's not quite as close but we'll still get that motion of it drinking straight towards us which will be quite special so there we go see see how it scoops up isn't that very cool I wonder when the last time we saw a bird of prey like this drinking was certainly a first for me like I say while I've been with Safari Live I have seen it before um, but it's not here at the lodge and, and well at Safari Live and not definitely not filmed it yet that's for sure So pity the light is the wrong side of it, but it is a much better angle from here because we can get sort of low and eye level as it goes down and scoops up bits of water. You can see it's just watching and checking the Egyptian geese that went across and then it'll start drinking again. There we go, scooping up a little bit of water. That's very cool. You see, it's just little droplets, little droplets. It's much like the cats; they don't get a lot in the beak at, as you know, in a quick time. But they have the opportunity to spend quite a bit of time actually drinking. So, Wild Heart, you want to know how tall these birds can get? They'll get to about 70 centimeters as fully grown in terms of their height. So, 70 centimeters, just under a meter tall, basically, which is quite big. So, this bird is. It's still immature, it's going into its sort of adult phase of life. It's probably fledged recently and has now spent a bit of its time kind of flying around. It will still probably be quite close to its natal area, so close to the nest. It hasn't shown any sign of colouring yet, so it won't be a threat to any of the adult birds and be pushed away. But it's definitely still got a bit of growing to do, so it's not fully grown just yet. So it'll get a little bit taller than what it is now, but not much. You can hear the go away bird alarm calling at it. So this is what these hot days bring and why checking the water holes in extremely hot weather like this is such an important thing because you're able to come across weird and wonderful things because it's dry it's hot it's driving animals that would be a little bit more shy and maybe have flown off before we got you to actually stay and drink just out of desperation so you'll find even smaller things like the nocturnal species that will come out even in the day just to try and quench their thirst I remember where the last time I saw a pangolin was in a very similar weather like this it was hot it was dry and it was that pang there was not much water around and the pangolin actually came to drink and was then at the water hole so it, it we were sitting there with a leopard funnily enough and the pangolin arrived but it just shows you that r random things will come out in heat like this because it really does sap the energy from everybody and everybody requires water and so they move into these areas to try and just actually hydrate themselves and stay full of water in these dry conditions but that is wonderful well done Seb much better from here hey, the angle at least 
can see there is a bit of a breeze blowing you can see the water is being ruffled up a little bit so that is a saving grace this afternoon although that the w wind does feel quite warm at this stage you can see all the feathers ruffling around but you'll also notice with this battle eagle that it knows that it's somewhat vulnerable when it's drinking so you'll see it takes a quick sip and then puts its head up and watches and looks around so you would think that there wouldn't be too many predators of a big bird like this but things like martial eagles um, leopards they would easily take a bird of this size jackals if it wasn't watching what's going on so they have to be aware and they'll constantly look around after drinking making sure that they're not being caught out and something's not coming from behind or to the sides and about to grab them I love when the wind blows and blows all those head feathers out. Later in life he will get a big fluffy head and they'll be jet black. But you can see, look there, where they're blowing out like that. It always makes them look a bit chicken-like when they have that. I always like it. Right. Now, our Battalier Eagle is still quenching its thirst so I think what we're going to do is probably leave it in peace I don't want to chase it away on a hot afternoon like this but talking about battalions and friends and all kinds of things Brent is in the Mara and would like to say hello 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 and welcome to the marvelous Mara my name is Brent Yersmith I have man aka Craig on camera and uh, we're on a mission and uh, so we are heading way down south towards the Burungat bridge uh, hoping that some wildebeest might have popped across from the other side of the river and have a look around the lookout crossings an area we haven't spent a lot of time in for a while so who knows what might happen very exciting remember hashtag safari live if you've got any questions now I uh, just on my way down and towards the Burungat Bridge. I wanted to go see uh, how the Paradise Pride zebra massing around there. So and there's always a good chance that the Paradise might feel like a snack. So I thought we'd have a quick look on our way down, and uh, I'm hoping to find some wildebeest, and of course with wildebeest some lions. Oh, look at that muddy, muddy old man. You are very muddy. And the old dugger boy. And you can just see some Thompson's gazelles off to the right and some impala with them. Now, the zebra that we're massing seem to have disappeared. still hasn't managed to fight off his gremlins from this morning. A very good afternoon to all of you. My name is Jamie and this afternoon Manu is on camera with me once again. And we're, I well, don't really know exactly where we're going, but I had an exciting report of a female cheetah in this area this morning. Unfortunately, it was just after the sunrise safari. But due to the fact that there's no real road names, you say, uh, descriptions of where things are are rather vague and you tend to find yourself wandering along hoping to see a big pile of cars somewhere but this is not far away at all from where Manu and myself actually saw we suspect Kakenya's daughter so Kakenya is a quite a famous female cheetah out here I've never seen her before but she's famous because she managed to raise one litter of four cubs to adulthood successfully in one go which for cheetah is outstanding parenting skills because they do have such a tough time with their cubs so if it is her she's very close to where we last saw her and the last time we saw her she had three cubs three very tiny very fluffy little cubs now that would be a special way to spend the afternoon I just kind of have to figure out exactly where it was. Now the, the risk is our signal stops at a certain point, so do our radio comms. So everybody hope that she's close enough that we'll actually be able to, we'll actually be able to share her with you. 
And don't forget, hashtag Safari Live on Twitter is how you can get hold of us. Yes, there's lots of vehicles that have come through here, but that makes sense. The border post is there. And look, thank you to all of you welcoming us back. It already feels like I've been back for ages, so I kind of forgot this is only my second drive back. It's really been lovely. I hear that the weather is stunning on Juma. It is not so stunning here. The wind was howling earlier. It's still it's still making life difficult. Our roof is in complete disarray. The flap is everywhere, but there's no point in even trying to put it back because the wind just whips it out of your hands. But it is really lovely to be back. We had a, a very relaxing leave. Went to Naivasha, did a lot of bird watching in Nairobi. But it's good to be back in the Mara. Especially when you've got the prospect of a cheetah somewhere, somewhere in the vicinity. Along this road is a massive old fig tree. And it's such a pity, but it's not, not forever, but for the moment our signal doesn't extend there. But it is the most exquisite old tree. And Manu and I, no it wasn't with Manu. It was with Viem, and we had to take shelter underneath that tree during a massive storm. And it protected us almost completely. We still got a little bit damp, but its crown covers the entire car. So that I wish I could show you. One day I will. One day I'll take you to that fig tree. But I'm still, I'm trying to cover some ground. A little bit nervous that the gremlins will start attacking us relatively soon so what we'll do is we'll send you back over to Tristan who is checking out Treehouse Dam. I was Jamie but I have departed, our batelier departed and so we are onwards and forwards to our next location which will be another waterhole that's where we're going to head we're going to head up to Biffleshook Dam in the hope that the Nkuhuma Pride has come over I know it's it's stiflingly hot and they'll probably be sleeping if they are there but while we've got light and we've got time to work with it's always better to head into that area and try and see if we can find them while we've got it because what happens is often is the case with the Inkumas is that they move ah now I believe that we have something very exciting but we have a 19 second delay so I have to talk to you for 19 seconds before we can quickly link which is not going to be so quick link across to Jamie and Amaro who's got a small spotted cat Okay, admittedly not the cheetah I was looking for, but something very exciting nevertheless. We have got a serval, and I, as I sent you across to Tristan, I saw it and slammed on my brakes, and it's hunting. It's after something. Unfortunately, if I reposition now, I think it's going to disappear. But this is the same, I'm almost certain this is our, the same serval as before, Manu. We're in almost the same area, the one that we saw kill a, a small rodent. I'm sure it's the same one. It is so relaxed around vehicles. It's such a pleasure. You can see it. Oh, oh, what are you doing? I want to see if it's going to do that really incredible spring that Serval are renowned for. They're spectacular jumpers. Okay, so we've got a mini cheetah. Can't complain about that. Little tail flicking. So for those of you that are unfamiliar with servals, it's essentially about, mm, I'd say twice the size of your average house cat. Not, oh, there goes, leaping into the grass. That was a surprise. Let's see if it can, let's see if it's caught something. Hold on. I think I just heard a little squeak. Heads up. Okay. I think it's a girl. Looked like a girl to me. I think it's a female. Hey girl. Gremlins General, you say poor rabbit. Look at this. Look how close she's, and it is a girl. Look how close she's let us get. Isn't this amazing? I don't know if it was a rabbit. <laughs> poor rabbit. I don't know what it was. She's got something though. Come on. Those massive ears. 
I don't want her to feel uncomfortable while she's trying to consume her meal, but she seems to be quite relaxed. She is glancing back at us. Exquisite creatures. What did you catch? She's definitely got something. I don't know what it was. Oh, there she goes. Hey, it's another rodent. Another bushfalt gerbil by the looks of things. That's a proper catch for the serval. How stunning is this? Manu, what is it with us and serval hunts, huh? It's going to start to become a thing. So this is the, the Lager and Love serval. She's always around here. She is. Lots of you saying that she is very pretty. She is, isn't she? She's absolutely gorgeous. She's, of course... Oh, oh is it still alive? She's playing with her food now. I think she might be in a very cat-like way. Did you just lose it? Com no, no, there it is. She is. She's playing with it. Oh, shame. Just like your house cats do at home when they catch themselves a, a hapless rodent. That's exactly what she's doing. <laughs> That's just natural instinct. Roshni, you say she seems nervous. I don't think so, Roshni. I, I think initially she did move that away from us, uh, just a little bit into the grass. She's not nervous of us. I actually think she's quite hyped up. She's quite. She's having fun with it. Look, she's let it go and then she's catching it once again. So she's, I'm sure those of you with house cats will have seen this behavior before. It's basically, it's instinct, and it's a great way for them to practice their skills. And you might find, uh, she doesn't look that young, but she might be quite young. In which case, this is a great way for her to essentially hone her hunting technique. I don't think she's nervous, she's twitchy, but that's because she's excited and she's playing with it. James, absolutely. We are so spoiled with the serval sightings in the Mara. They just are so much more relaxed here. And actually, servals are quite easy to habituate if you can find them. Oh, pounce again. You see, she's letting it go. She's letting it think that it's free, and then she pounces and grabs it again. And they are quite... They're like cheetah in that respect. They They get relaxed around people quite quickly. And I suspect if we had the time and we could track them, which of course we can't, they would habituate very quickly to people on foot as well, which would be astounding to be able to follow a serval around. She got it again. Oh, shame. Stop torturing the poor thing. It's always hard to watch, but that's very much a human perspective. From her perspective, this is her afternoon game plus a meal. Deadhead Tom, and much like Cheetah, yes, serval do domesticate very easily. And there is a breed of cat called a savannah cat because they are closely related. They're in the same family um, and the same genus as domestic cats. They are able to reproduce with domestic cats. And there's a type of cat called a savannah cat, which is kind of a mixture of a serval and a, and a domestic cat. Personally, and I, we often go on about this, it's been a while since we've done the the talk about it personally and i think we all feel the same i really don't believe in that sort of thing oh there we go she's finally eating it i think it's i think it's human it's basically a human ego boost to want to have an exotic pet or exotic animal as a pet we've got cats we've got dogs they've been domesticated for tens of thousands of years in certain cases they need us and that's fine though you know We've got companionship in the form of pets. We really don't need to add wild animals to our list. They belong wild. But yes, people have domesticated servals. I actually know people who've raised serval. And just an important lesson, serval are okay to domesticate. They tend to be like cheetah. They tend to be quite even-tempered. Caracal, which is the other medium-sized cat, well, I know that I, all of the cases I know have ended in tragedy 
with domesticated caracal. Just like that. Entire rodent swallowed whole. You are going to cough up one big hairball, I imagine. Oh, she's exquisite, isn't she? The grace and the lines of her body. So this is for Roshni, who's saying that she looks nervous. She's walking right at us now, or right next to us. She's going to walk right past the car, not quite right past the car, but right in front of us. Oh, wow. Look at this. Right, well, there's our afternoon plan for now. Sina, I'm not sure how old this cat is. It's fully grown. She is fully grown. And she seems to have a territory here. I'm pretty sure it's her. But just like Cheetah, actually, here's a really good idea. I hope that those of you with um, who are watching have got some screenshots to share on hashtag Safari Live on Twitter. I don't because my... I don't have a camera because Brent's got my lens, naturally. His is broken. So if you get screenshots of her spot patterns, we can actually determine with absolute certainty if it's the same serval that we saw hunting the other night. Oh, because that's quite a while ago now. Uh, what are we talking about? Oh, her age. I think she's established, but I don't know how old she is. Janet, you say you've never seen you've never seen a serval on camera before. Well, there you go. I'm very glad to have provided you with this opportunity. And Manu, of course, doing an amazing job. Look at that. She's stalking down the road just like a cheetah. I am going to stick with our serval for as long as possible. Oh, beautiful. While she wanders down the road and I catch up, let's go back over to Brent, who has found one of the most iconic male lions in the world. It is the, the, the king of the crossings at Scarface himself, looking quite lethargic uh, on the edge of a croton thicket. Not far from where we saw the Paradise Pride girls this morning. There he is, look at him as he lifts his head and looks at us. And that very, very iconic face. Oh, he's a bit of a tired kitty at the moment. But at least his head's up and he's not a flat cat. So I'm pretty sure... The Paradise Pride will be around here somewhere. And, um, who knows, maybe avoiding him as there's not too much to eat around. So I, don't, I probably don't want to share. He is an absolutely gorgeous lion, though. Okay, question. So, here's the way to magnificent now of course he is part of for those of you who don't know part of a coalition of uh, three other males uh, known as the musketeers not to be confused with the cheetah musketeers uh, it's the lion musketeers and they dominate the area around the main river crossings Alex, do cats have predators? Alex? hello alex alex is wondering do cats have predators uh, well it, Oh, I suppose uh, to a degree, yes, um, but normally it'll be pred uh, competition rather than predators. So lion will kill leopard, uh, leopard will kill lion cubs, lion will kill hyena, hyena will kill lion, and vice versa, and that goes all the way down to the little cats. So it's very different. It's not because of um, to eat in most cases. It's 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 due to try remove any form across the... Oh, quickly across to Jamie! Our serval is at it once again. She's heard something in the grass. So I, I didn't want to tear you away from Scar so quickly, but I do want you to be able to watch the behavior. And I kind of, we kind of missed the hunt earlier. And I love watching this because it's something so unique. It's a completely, I guess in a way, it's almost a leopard-like technique. But they get so much closer. And watch the way she's using those ears. There's a really proper visual communication stripe right there with the white and the black. Oh, whatever it was, she seems to have lost interest. She was stalking towards that area. 
You can see her turning her head constantly, stopping. Oh, oh! Oh, oh! Did she get it? An amazing change of direction. She heard something. It, the rodent obviously popped its head out of its hole or something similar. And she immediately bounded back. But I think she was too far. Surely she was too far to have caught it. Ah, I think she missed that one. Good try, though. Bound, bound. Nicely done, Manu. That was a surprise change in direction. And there she goes, off again. Looking for all the world. Apart from the, the short tail, she looks for all the world like a little mini cheetah. Sharp face, though. They've got very sharp faces. No, I didn't do it. Welcome back to the Sunset Safari. I didn't do it. Servals do have den sites for their cubs. Um, I've actually even heard of them going into old abandoned holes to keep their little actually kittens to keep their kittens safe um, but they'll also use e exactly like leopards or lions will do they'll use some dense vegetation perhaps underneath a thick gardenia bush for example something where there's plenty of cover hollows in trees is another place especially if there's a hollow at the base of the tree they'll hide their kittens there and one thing I've noticed from following the one serval around near the sausage tree pride territory one thing I've noticed about them is that they do tend to utilize overhangs of, of drainage lines so the the dried up riverbeds they often seem to be popping out of or one in particular seems to pop out of that area a lot let's go a little bit closer since she is so very obliging and so comfortable with vehicles as she hunts in the long grass again and the serval sightings have just got better and better and we actually have the wildebeest to thank for it because we can see they've eaten all the grass and they've actually been very much assisted us. Well, they have very much assisted us in clearing some space so we can see the servals that we find. There she goes, stalking forward again. I think she spotted something. David, I've never seen a serval sleeping out in the open. Um, I've only ever seen them sleeping or disturb them sleeping under bushes and safe places, places where they can be hidden. I think they don't really, a, a lion knows that it's the top predator out here essentially, whereas a serval doesn't have that luxury. And anything, any of the big cats that came across a serval will try and kill it. In fact, our, our last TV show episode, five minutes before we had the sausage tree pride hunting a serval, it was terrifying. They were so close to catching that serval that lives in their drainage line, lives around that drainage line. So there are too many threats out here. A leopard, a hyena, a lion, che even cheetah will kill a serval if they have an opportunity. Oh, she trots. Let's try and get a bit closer. I actually, David, in Napa. David, you, I don't know. I don't know if, if I would consider them the most successful hunters out here because to be completely honest with you, I haven't spent enough time with servals. I haven't spent enough time following them around. I don't know what their success rate is. From what I've seen, the efforts that we've seen, they seem to be highly successful. Let's just take our revs down a little bit while we follow her. I would suggest that they're more successful than something like a cheetah or a lion. Except during the migration, of course. That, that skews all statistics. I don't know, David. I don't know if there's actually even any literature on serval success rate. There must be. There must be. So you're going into stalk mode again. Let's stop and watch her. Well, if any of you do know of articles with serval hunting success rate, you could send that through on hashtag Safari Live on Twitter. I would be very much appreciative because I'm honestly not sure. Well, let me let me put it this way: of the two start to finish hunts we've we've witnessed so far, it was two out of three in terms of success. 
not really much to build a data set. Not really a data set, though, is it? We can't draw any conclusions from that. Aaron, the agility was amazing, wasn't it? The way that she changed direction, I suppose uh, they're, they're very, very similar to house cats in that respect. Lightning fast reflexes. What I really would love to see and love to show you is the way that they jump up into the air. They're famous for flushing birds. Things like sand grouse and other bird species that spend a lot of time on the ground. And they leap up and catch them in mid-flight. I've only ever seen it twice. And unfortunately, neither of those times was even when I was working with Safari Live. But that extraordinary leap up into the air. You can see how powerful and how long their back legs are and how long their bodies are. She's turning back. Maggie, um, several are solitary creatures, they're solitary cats, very similar to something like a, a leopard. So you'll have their, the females have their territory, they're territorial, the females will have their territories, the males will have their territories, there'll be a degree of overlap with males having slightly larger territories, and the only time you'll really see them socializing is when they're either mating or when a female has kittens. But animals are odd things, especially cats, as we've seen with leopards. I wouldn't be surprised if there's situations where you see more than one ser adult serval associating with each other. What's up, girl? What are you after? Imagine if serval was, were um, social, like lions. Imagine seeing a little pride of servals wandering through. VM would love that. That would be right up VM's alley. Servals are VM's second most favorite thing to film. Uh, see now, um, servals are protected in as much as they, they live in reserves that are protected, where all of the wildlife is protected, um, and certainly here in Kenya. However, I don't think that they're classified in terms of their... Um, their red list classification, I think they're probably not listed as vulnerable yet. I think they're actually relatively common. More common than perhaps even we realize. Let's go forward a bit so that Manu's got a view. I think potentially more common than we realize. They're just secretive, so we hardly ever see them. They don't have, I don't think they're on, it's not on the same level as something like a, a rhino or a pangolin that sits on, in terms of non-tradable animal parts. It sits on the first appendix. Where is she? There she is, there she is, there she is. I think she's having a drink, actually. And a little lugger. To see her tail twitching there. And I would say that the biggest threat to serval would be, obviously, habitat loss. And then you'll probably find, I don't think they're uh, animal trafficking, potentially, I suppose, the exotic pet trade. And then also snares, bushmeat snares. They would be potential victims, especially with their tendency to wander about in the way that they do. Would place them highly at risk. She's going back towards the main road. She's using this little, she's using this little dip to remain hidden. And Jerry, you want to know if she's a kind of lynx? Did I hear that correctly, Alice? Let me just check that I got it right. Uh, no, not not in so much as she is. Obviously, she is a, a cat, so it's part of the same family. Um, she is related to, but not a type of lynx. She's a different genus. Wait, hold on. Lynxes, lynxes are, give me one second, the brain's, the brain's shifting. She, no, she's in the same genus. Lynxes are felis, so are, so are, um, so are serval, so they are related to each other, they are in the same genus, obviously different continents. Um, you'll find that the, the animal that is more similar 
to a lynx is the caracal. The most beautiful cat. Have we ever seen one on a live safari? I've, I haven't shown you one. Perhaps you have. In, in, in terms of safari lives history and wild earth's history, those of you who have been watching for many years, have you ever seen a caracal on the live safaris? Or is that something that we still have to do? That's something we have to add to your list. Oh, sorry, I was having a blonde moment. Lynxes are feelers, so it's the same genus. Where is she going? There she is. She's coming back again. She's just stalking up and down this um this little dip. Looking again for potential prey. The Felis family, of course, African wild cats, your domestic cats, caracals, servals. All of the small and medium sized cats. Imagine if we could follow her for days at a time. Uh, now we have a question, I, I mentioned earlier that she's a female. Uh, we have a question about what the difference is between a male and a female serval. None, mass, no massive differences, uh, just in terms of size. The male's a little bit bigger, but it's not as noticeable as, for example, the difference between a male and a female leopard. So the way that I determined was to, was in the sort of the normal way, which was to check underneath her tail and just see whether or not I could see any protruding parts that would belong to a boy. And she definitely doesn't have them. I don't know what it is. I think it's the fact that her eyes are quite gummy. Makes her look older than perhaps she is. Oh, she's going to go right behind us. Let's just sit still. Maybe she'll come and use us as cover. Look at this. This is so cool. <laughs> This is the best wild serval sighting I've ever had. She's walking right behind us. I can't do anything now. I have to just sit. I didn't do it. Yes, serval scent mark, just like um, cats do. Ur urine would be the predominant scent marking. Oh, goodness, sorry, I'm having an earpiece nightmare of a day. So urination would be the main way that they scent mark. And yes, they're territorial, so they do. Manu, can you see her? Is she going back... Is she close? She's here, between, in the gap. I don't want to startle her. How close would she say she is? Maybe 20 meters. 20 meters, okay, we can, then we can move. This is amazing! I'm going to spend as much time as I can with this serval. It's extraordinary. Let's go back while we reposition. Let's go to Tristan, who's with some, well, let's just say slightly larger cats. I do indeed, and you can see they're in a state of recline. They're hot and bothered, but they're lying underneath the bushes is the entire Inkuuma pride and our injured lioness. So for those of you who are a bit squeamish, it's probably a good thing to look away now, as you'll see her hip is not in good condition at all. It is fairly mangled, unfortunately, so there is a bit of a wound, saying likely that there is serious damage to that left hip. Now, the thing is, is that she is walking fine. I spoke to the guys that saw her walking this morning. Apparently she's walking just fine, so it looks worse than it actually is. It's just that her skin has peeled off, basically, from the muscle, and that's why it looks really, really nasty, and it looks a lot worse than it probably actually is, and I'm sure she will recover from it. As long as she's able to get food and water, she'll be fine, but it is a nasty wound. How she got it? No idea. Um, they went into the Kruger National Park. They were absolutely fine, all five of them. They went into the Kruger, and they came back 
and she had that wound not one of the other lionesses is sporting a wound at all so i really don't know what happened to her she's one of the the mothers of the original cubs so she's not the mother of the of the new cubs but i don't know what's happened to her and how what's caused that there's no other scratch on her there's no bite marks on her rest of her body so i really really well and truly don't know what could have caused that but either way it must be seriously uncomfortable in heat like this with the amount of flies that are around she must be driven absolutely mad you can see she's actually not even going to lie on that hip at all she'll probably just lie the way she is for the next few weeks while that starts to dry and to heal up a little bit and only once it's actually healed a bit will she start to lie on that left side again the good news is that the female with the cubs is here she's lying just to the left there so that female there she is very thin at the moment but you can see she still does have milk and has still got suckle marks so that's a quite a good sign that those cubs are still alive and it's not unusual to see lionesses that are a little bit on the skinnier side when they've got cubs particularly if she's the only lioness in the pride that's got them because she's having to spend a lot of time away from the pride tracking back and forth trying to feed them the, the cubs are absorbing a lot of nutrients from her and she's spending a lot of time on her own which means she's not going to be feeding as well as everybody else and that means she's going to be a little bit on the skinnier side but nothing to worry about she's still absolutely fine and, and like I say the good thing is that there's still milk there so it means she is producing and hopefully the cubs are fine mooks you're worried about an infection on this lioness well it is a possibility that they could get it but you'll be surprised how resilient these animals are she'll groom that all the time she's going to lick it she's going to clean it she might get a little bit of infection but as long as she's getting food and water her body should be over be able to overcome it it's it's a nasty wound for sure but I have seen worse on lions and I've seen them come back from worse so it's just gonna look really bad for a while but once it's kind of dried up a little bit and, and that skin starts to heal and starts to scar you'll find that it's not going to be as bad and she should make a full recovery I was alluding to the fact this morning about Mfumo's face when he had that massive hole in his face and everybody thought that he was going to die and that this is the end of him but you will be surprised just how strong these animals are and you might be wondering why we haven't interfered and tried to dart this Inkuma female and treat that wound well the simple fact of the matter is that it's been caused by nature so if she were not to survive unfortunately I know it's a hard stance to take but unfortunately when these animals are injured in nature sometimes it's nature's way of just getting rid of a bloodline that is slightly weaker than others and you do see it happening and, and imagine how many impalas and wildebeest and zebras and varying other animals have walked around here with similar wounds that have not even been looked at twice because they are not a lioness so it's just a blanket rule that we use and it means that there's no black and white or gray i mean there's no gray area it's just black and white is that if an animal is affected by us as people we will try and fix it but if it isn't affected by an animal then well these animals have to try and sort of come right or the nutrients that they would provide will then go back into the soil. I know it's a really horrible way to think about things and especially when it's lionesses or leopards that we see daily and we we get to know really well but in this situation here like I say it looks a lot worse than it actually is. It's um, it's more a flesh wound and a skin wound than it is a deep sort of laceration or any sort of breakage of the bone and the fact that she's moving absolutely fine and walking without a limp means that she's actually not sustained too much damage it'll be a bit tender that's for sure and it'll look quite nasty but that should come right it's just going to be a bit of a mission to keep clean and to make sure that she doesn't get too much of an infection what we actually need is those flies to land there and, and for maggots to start cleaning it out because maggots even though it looks really bad are actually not the worst thing I remember Fumo's face had a few maggots in them and that helped just clean the wound and get that nice healthy skin and eventually it will all stitch together but it will take some time for her to come right I still just can't work out what's actually happened to her I mean, it must have been a um, uh, maybe a male or another female grabbed her by the rump there and pulled and that ripped the skin but uh, it's really an odd wound because she's got not one other mark on her so there's no cuts around her face or her front legs or bite marks on her back which would be typical of a fight so how she's gotten that I don't really know and it's not typical of a hunting injury 
David, do you think Buffalo will? That's why I was just about to say that Buffalo don't cause injuries like that. It's it's very seldom that you'd find a Buffalo causing a almost scrape injury that this is. That you know, Buffalo is generally you'll find a horn injury or a, a broken leg from an impact. Is very seldom that you'll see a sort of ripping wound like that without a hole somewhere there. There's no evidence of a hole where a horn could have gone in to break that skin like that. So I'm not sure. I, my, my suggestion or well, my guess would be more another predator or in particular lion maybe hyenas it's also possible i've seen quite a few lionesses with bad injuries to their tail from hyenas because hyenas will try to go around the back and nip and bite around the tail area in fact the salala lions we know that there's been two different females that lost their tails due to hyenas and the one female that we have that's currently alive from the salalas that lost her tail she had extensive bite wounds around that tail it was actually because i saw her about two three days after it happened and the tail itself was completely stripped of meat there was actually a piece of bone that eventually fell off and then there was these kind of similar wounds all around her back legs and feet and on her on her bum area so it's a similar wound to what you'd see from hyenas but far more restful and far more sort of content are the rest of the pride that are all sitting around in the quarry thickets the cubs all look fairly good um, so they don't they're not full 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 but they all looking healthy and happy which is great news now Faisal you reckon that maybe a territorial fight well that's what I would lean towards you know they went way out of their territory why they went there I'm not quite sure at all because they went right down towards Inkoro and then from Inkoro crossed into the Kruger National Park which is in a very different area than the Nkumas have been in a very long time so maybe they bumped into the Torchwood Pride they could have bumped into other male lions there that they don't know they could have bumped into other females you know there are females around Hamilton's Hoya Hoya that area so it's very possible that they bumped into some other predators uh, particularly lions and had a bit of a territorial dispute and that's what it's, has happened the thing about a territorial dispute and particularly with lions is that there's no ways the rest of the pride would have just dropped and ran and left this female all to herself they would never have just said you know we're not going to defend her and you would have found some of the others having injuries if they got into a really big fight the only way that this could have happened is that she was separated by from the rest of the pride and then this happened but I would imagine then she would have sported a lot more bite wounds from other lions. I think this is more likely hyenas work than anything else but it's all speculation it's really difficult to know without actually being there and seeing what's happening and also the way she's lying at the moment I can't see what the top of the wound looks like and whether there's a mark on the top where you could actually see a hole or a bite or something like that so maybe when she stands up a bit later because we will spend time with the Nkuma Pride and I'm sure they're going to head down to Bufflesook Dam for a drink this evening and maybe when she does that then we'll be able to see whether there's actually marks of canines or any sort of sign of teeth that are around that wound or what could have potentially caused it but like I say as much as it looks nasty and as much as it probably hurts her she will come right from this I, I really don't think it's as bad as it looks sometimes these wounds look worse than they really are and that's I suppose easy for us to say when we don't have a massive chunk missing out of our backside but she seems to be okay she's like I say the fact that she's moving and the fact that she's walking without a limp is generally a good indication that there's no real physical damage to bone or ligament structure and it's just a muscular skin structure and that will eventually grow back as long as she keeps it clean and is well fed and well hydrated then she should be okay and the rest of her body condition is good you know this although this only happened three four days ago because that's when they went into the Kruger the rest of her looks absolutely fine she's not showing any sort of signs of discomfort besides that nasty gash on her bum See, I think she wants to roll over, but it's probably a little bit painful to lie on still. It's still a bit too fresh to actually be putting too much weight on. It's like when you either have a burn or friction wound, so if you fall over on like t tar or asphalt or something like that, you know it's, the skin is very sensitive to the touch for a few days. And so I'm sure that's the same with this. And only once it starts to stitch and heal a little bit, will she be able to roll over onto that other side. So she'll probably be a bit uncomfortable for the next little bit. And this heat really can't be helping. It's, it must be a little unpleasant when it comes to heat. As you can see the rest of the pride is completely at home in this quarry bush. They found themselves 
the smallest bit of shade possible. I don't know why they're not lying further down because down in the drainage is a beautiful sandy cool area and maybe during the middle of the day there was no shade there but now it would be the perfect place for lions to lie. The bank is making this nice long shadow and the sand's quite moist there so I would imagine it would be a lot cooler and a lot more comfortable for these lions down there than it is where we are now. See, like you're wondering what weather lions can withstand. Well, lions are fairly widespread. If you think about it, there are lions in the, in the desert areas where temperatures can really soar into the high 120s Fahrenheit or, or close to 50 degrees Celsius. In fact, more in the sun in those desert sections. And then if you go into the very same deserts in the winter months it can often drop below freezing and the lions are able to survive there so it is possible that they can oh is it a bit stiff my girl shame you can see the way she's rolling it's a little on the stiff side and there's no other wounds i can see on her left flank is there no nothing there but she is a little bit stiff and you can see she's trying to keep that hip off the ground so she's just twisted her body a little bit but she seems fairly content at this stage. She doesn't seem as though she's too bad. Let's see if she rolls all the way over and actually puts some pressure on it. So they can actually withstand quite a lot. And if you think about lions that are in the zoos across the world, there are lions that are in Berlin, for example, where it snows sometimes. And so you'll find a situation where, you know, they can withstand that. But what will happen with lions is that their coats will change a little bit. So if they're in a place like... Berlin let's say and they're in a zoo there their lines will get big and fluffy and they'll become the coats become thick and so that they insulate better whereas here in Africa you'll find that they'll have a very fine coat and even here in the winter and summer the coat will change slightly it will thicken a little bit during the winter months and then thin out as we get into these hotter summer temperatures like we have now you can see they're not too bad though because none of them are fully panting if it was really excessively hot and they'd eaten a lot you would have found that their breathing rate would be super quick their mouths would be open as they use the evaporation and, and the moisture on the tongue that would evaporate when panting to cool that blood on the tongue and mouth and send the cooler blood back into the body but in this case they found some shade and a bit of a breeze and they seem to be okay so that's fairly good and i'm surprised actually because i thought they would have been a lot hotter than what they are but just in terms of numbers with the Nkuma Pride, in, in, especially if there's a wound on one of them, it's always good just to check how many are here. But all five females are here, and, and I counted five cubs at least, and I think there's the sixth one is further on where I can't see. So it looks like all the pride is here. There's no sign of any males, so I think the Birminghams are not here at the moment. There's probably one Birmingham that's in Buffalo's Hook that we know of, close to where Mvula was this morning, and then two in Torchwood. I don't, like I say, know where the fourth one is, but no sign of any of the Birminghams here with these lionesses at the moment but it's all very sedate at this stage I was kind of hoping that we would come to Bufflesuk Dam and there'd be some elephants around and we'd be able to spend some time with the Ellies and wait for our lions to wake up because I think they're going to be seriously sleepy until sun starts to set it's going to be one of those days where it's going to take them a while the thing is though is that they're very skinny and that means that they will be on the move tonight and they will be looking for food I doubt that they're going to sit around too long I'm sure they're going to make use of the nighttime conditions and particularly because we've just come from a full moon period and we know that full moon periods it's a lot more difficult for our cats to hunt and so now they'll try and utilize that moon still down in the early hours of the evening because remember the moon rise will be around sort of midnight at the moment just after midnight and it will still be quite bright and so they'll try and use the sort of first part of the night when it's dark there's a bit of a wind today's been hot which means that a lot of the daylight animals have really kind of been battered by the sun and will be a little lethargic tonight which will be perfect for the lions to then try and take advantage but I'm sure like I say that they'll go for a drink before they're going to do anything else so we'll be patient and wait and just see and hope they're going to go down to drink because it will be beautiful if they do but talking about patience and luck it seems Jamie has managed to find her serval again and must be beaming at the thought of this sighting It is absolutely safe to say that this is the longest I have ever spent with a serval in my entire life. This is phenomenal. And this is going to be the plan for the rest of the drive unless I lose her. 
I think. It's going to be interesting trying to follow her at night as it gets dark, but this is definitely what we're going to do. Right, obviously my brain is still on holiday because I owe you all a sincere apology. Uh, first of all, of course Taylor saw a caracal on cheetah planes. I remember that. I was on leave, but I remember how excited she was. And I remember that we spent ages looking for it after, or the, the weeks after she found it. The th second point is that I'm talking utter nonsense about the genus. It is not Felis. I didn't know that. And the only reason I double-checked it was because something was ringing alarm bells in my mind. I always assumed it was a Felis. It's not. It's not part of that genus. It is called Leptellarus. Leptellarus, serval? It's in its own complete distinct genus. So it's related, obviously, closely enough that it can interbreed with cats, with members of a Felis genus. But it is not in the genus Felis. <laughs> Starts to rhyme after a while. Leptellarus. L-E-P-T-A-I-L-U-R-U-S. Somewhere around my law professor is bemoaning the lack of Latin education that we all had as in <laughs> during our school years. But anyway, there you go. I got the genus completely wrong. I apologize. Obviously, the brain is still on holiday. She seems to be taking, speaking of holidays, she seems to be taking a short break. Speaking of lying out in the open... I think that they do do it, but they don't rest as comfortably as lions do. So they don't fall fast asleep. She's got to remain alert. She could easily find herself in an awkward position, especially out here in the open, where she can't get up a tree or away from a potential predator. Now, Senac, the long legs are built for, designed for jumping. So whilst they are relatively fast runners, they obviously don't have the same turn of speed that something like a cheetah does, but they are built for powerful, powerful leaps in their ability to catch birds. So they do leap up. They're not... I've seen them climb. Um, I don't think that they're particularly well adapted. I think they can climb. I, I haven't seen it very often. I don't think they're as limber in trees as something like a leopard might be. But they can climb, but essentially those long legs are for those pounces that we've seen her make. And when you see them sort of, they almost seem to hover in the air with all those, with all four legs tucked up under them as they move in to catch their prey. But they do have very long legs, and of course, the savannah cats that we were talking about, that's one of the characteristics of that particular breed. What is utterly devastating, well, I find it quite devastating, is the first thing when I googled serval, the f while I was sitting here waiting, while you were with Tristan, the first thing that came up was, how much is a serval, I think, or, or where can I buy a serval, or something like that. That was the first thing that came up. Terribly distressing, folks. If you have any desire to buy a serval, please just go to your shelter and adopt something. Adopt a cat, adopt a dog. Don't go out and buy a serval or a savannah cat. Oh, Lynn. Gosh, I have absolutely no idea how many serval are in the Mara. I would say lots. I would say they're, they're quite a high-density animal. I have little to no idea if I had to guess. I mean, the, the whole of the Mara... Okay, let's, let's just take the triangle, which is where we are at the moment. From the triangle, I would... Gosh, I'd guess, I think, you're probably looking at at least 100 individuals. Probably even more. I, I really am not sure. I think it would be utterly fascinating to actually do a proper population count. I'm not sure how you do it. Camera traps, maybe? Um, I guess that would probably be one way to go about it. You'd have to have a lot of camera traps, though. Hmm. Very good question. I'll I'll try and see if there, there must be somebody who's researched servals here before. There must be. <laughs> There's so many researchers around. Now, James, when it comes to the mating process, with the you want to know who seeks out which, whether the male or the female seek each other out, it's often the female that is the most vocal about advertising her Easter cycle. So very similar to leopards, um, uh, that what they do is they scent mark. I, I've seen it once before with a domesticated serval. Lots of scent marking, urine spraying, and quite a high-pitched, almost meowing sound that they make. 
and that's the way that they announce that they're in estrus and that obviously the male will then pick up on that sound pick up on that scent and he will then they'll kind of come together or meet together but essentially it's the female that initiates that whole process and it's not uh, as far as i know it's it's not a protracted estrus cycle not like a, with a leopard i think it's only really around about four or five days and then they separate once again I know that there are serval kittens on the other side of the river with a very relaxed female. Imagine if we got to know this female's movements. Imagine. And we saw her with kittens. Wouldn't that be spectacular? I don't think she... I can't see any suckle marks. So I don't think that she has kittens. But imagine. Nora? Um, you're looking at, oh, there she is. She disappears. It's actually quite extraordinary. So, Nora, you're looking at around about three to four kittens that they will have. And they will, as I spoke, or as we spoke about before, they will hide them away in den sites. And then, their mortality rate. I don't know. I would guess that their mortality rate is quite high. I would say that it's not quite as high as something like a cheetah, which has an absolutely massive, potentially around about 80% mortality rate before their first year, sometimes even more, depending on the situation, and depending on the density of lions. So I would, I would put it, if I had to guess, at around about 50%. It's, it's always a struggle for predators to raise youngsters. And there's so many things that must threaten a serval kitten, but I'm not sure the exact number. Deadhead Tom, speaking of, of, of course, the biggest threat when we think of cub mortality, um, with lions, of course, it's strange males that are often the the ones responsible for the death of the cubs because they kill them to bring them back into estrus. I don't think that that, co that behavior is very common in serval. I don't think it's, it's particularly common. I think it would be quite unusual. It makes sense for that to happen. I mean, leopards do it. Lions definitely do it because they've got such a short time to breed. But I don't... I, serval are not a particularly antagonistic species. They stay out of each other's way. They have their territories. They have their home ranges. But, I mean, I would say that serval fights are very, very unusual. I don't think it's that common. What would happen if a male encountered a female with little ones? I think they'd probably go their separate ways. Remember, there's also not as big of a sexual dimorphism between the males and the females. Yes, the, the males are stronger, but not by a huge amount. And um, the female's probably more than capable of defending her cubs, whereas with a, a lioness, she could potentially be 70, 80 kilograms lighter than the male. She's much, much smaller. Leopards, again, they're half the size of the males almost. So they, they don't have a chance to defend their cubs, whereas I think a serval could put up a pretty big fight if she had to. So I don't think that behavior is common. I think we'll learn a great deal more as we spend more and more time hopefully with this particular serval. That would be spectacular. Patrick, they are not particularly noisy. They don't call or roar. Well, obviously they don't roar. I, I meant they're not as vocal as lions roaring or leopards sawing, for example. They do meow and they do there's soft sort of chirping contact calls, similarish to a cheetah. Little soft calls. But for the most part they are relatively silent. Again, as I said, a female in estrus, she does make quite a bit of noise. She yowls a little bit. Now, our pride is still fast asleep at the moment. You can see the eyes are closed behind the grass. and So we've repositioned slightly so we can see all of the little cubs because we've decided, well, the wound is the wound. It's a mystery and we're going to just carry on with the day and try and look at more happier things, which is the pride lying underneath the trees and having a really kind of close-up cuddle. You'd think in this heat that they would try and spread themselves out a little bit, but no, everybody's in a tight-knit ball here, yeah, and again, they're all pretty much touching each other. So you can kind of find a common link between them all. They all seem to be in some way 
touching somewhere along the body so it's quite funny to see again it's a carpet of lions as they sleep their way along now apparently there is an elephant slowly but surely making its way up this side it's coming from Nyala Road north and heading northwards so I'm sure it's going to arrive at the dam just now it won't be in the next sort of 10-15 minutes but it should be here at some point and that might be quite interesting to see what the lions do when that elephant bull arrives and to see if they actually try and kind of or if the elephant bull smells them and comes this way or if they just watch it from here and get a bit of an idea to go down to the water what has been quite interesting while we've been sitting here is the grey go-away birds. They have not kept quiet for one second. They've been just alarm calling after alarm call after alarm call after alarm call. Now generally with sleeping lions like this, you won't find go-away birds making this much noise. They kind of make it when the lions are walking around, but otherwise they don't. So I think there must be maybe some sort of bird of prey here, maybe an owl somewhere in this general vicinity. We know they make a lot of noise when they see owls. So I think there must be something else other than the lions, because generally after the lions are fast asleep like this and are not really paying attention, the go-away birds keep quiet. But these, this bunch is just going on and 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 on. So, interesting though. Look at that one, it's got its paws completely suspended off the ground. It's busy resting them on a guari branch. <laughs> it can't be comfortable at all. The positions lions get themselves into in sleeping just looks so uncomfortable. Those legs are off the ground. This other lioness has got her head twisted up and against the back of another one, which must be so hot in these conditions. So, that doesn't look very comfortable at all. And then, well, if you've got a lioness sleeping on your back, it also can't be that comfy. So, those three there are not in exactly the, the most comfortable situations. But I suppose if you're a lion, you just don't care, which is fine. I reckon. Seb, this is how you would sleep, eh? <laughs> Sometimes. Yeah. Sometimes. <laughs> Brian, you're wondering if the lions snore. Um, I have heard uh, the Birmingham males every now and then making a bit of a snoring noise, but generally, no, not really. Uh, most of the time, they're actually quite s quiet sleepers. You will hear them taking big, deep breaths, but in terms of snoring not really like I ha like I say I have heard the Birmingham's once or twice but this in Kahuma Pride I've never heard any of these females snoring maybe they have at some point but I certainly haven't heard it you can see one females catching flies at the back there As you can see the flies are irritating her and she doesn't even have the wound so every now and then you'll watch them they'll pop their head up and they try and snap at the flies we saw Asana doing it last night it's a common thing for cats is that they get so irritated after a while that they try and kind of bite at the flies of course they generally are so slow that they miss them altogether and the reason why the flies congregate around their faces particularly their nose and their mouth I was talking earlier about when they're panting and that the saliva and, and the the moisture that evaporates um, and cools their blood down it's the same thing there's moisture there and the flies actually come and sequest the moisture off of that area so the nose the gum lines the mouth if they've got their mouth open is where flies will often congregate to try and get some of the moisture rather than going down to a water hole or something like that they do it off the lines themselves which is I suppose very uncomfortable you can imagine flies going in your ears especially sensitive hearing like they've got it must be absolutely awful they also have hairy ears which means that they must disturb the hair in the ear and must be quite itchy at times but that is about as content a pride as you could imagine Zed, you're wondering if their children sleep with them or if they always go to the den. Well, Zed, it depends on the age. So as you can see here, there's a whole bunch of smaller lions in amongst the adult females. And these are all now sub-adults, so they're still dependent on their mothers, but they're lying with the pride and travel with the pride everywhere now, so they don't go anywhere. But the one female, she has fairly new cubs. In fact, those cubs must be now approaching about six weeks old, and actually we can start trying to look for the den a lot more now. Once they reach six to eight weeks, we can go and check up on the den fairly regularly so they will be more in the den and won't be coming to carcasses yet so she'll travel from the pride to the den and back to the pride and, and back and forth but won't bring the cubs to the den just yet once they reach about 12 weeks that's when she'll start introducing them to carcasses so if they let's say the incumbents bring down a buffalo she'll go fetch them from the den bring them let them start feeding off a little bit of meat and introducing them to the pride once they reach about six months then they generally are walking around with the pride pretty much all the time in fact even from about four or five months they're starting to walk around with the pride and then they go and, and they get to then the size that these ones are which is a year old and they're pretty much a fully functioning member 
they're not quite hunting yet but they are in the pride and watching the hunts so they'll be close by they just don't participate too much in what's going on only once they reach about two and a half three are they then starting to hunt so that's the kind of span of of these uh, lions and you'll find that generally the females like i say bring their cubs to the pride as quick as possible because it takes a lot of energy for them to go back and forth from a den it also means that they miss the pride the pride could go off hunting and to find the pride again is a difficult job they've got a contact call they've got to look they've got to try and track them down and that exerts more energy than they need so as soon as they can get the cubs to the pride and get the cubs walking with the pride the better so it's not too long that that happens so it'll be another two months, I would say, for this fe youngest female with the newer cubs until they with the pride more often than not. But that is one sleepy lion at the back there. It's taking it very easy. You can see how they use their paws for pillows a lot of the time. It's not the most comfortable position. Generally, when they're very tired, they don't lie like that. They more lie on their sides like the rest of the pride is doing. That seems to be a lot more comfortable for them when they're very sleepy like that and so you'll find it's only when they've woken up a bit and looked around that you'll see their heads on their paws Mishman you're wondering if these big cats like lions eat grass to settle their stomachs like domestic cats do they do indeed so lions leopards cheetah i've seen them all doing it and even wild dogs they'll also consume grass from time to time but lions and cheat and leopards all the time especially in the summer months you find they feed a lot of green green grass and so they will eat and chomp away for a while and it all just helps with settling of the stomach and also, sometimes it will help with the regurgitation process that will then get rid of all of the bone and fur that they battle to digest inside their stomachs. But you can hear those go-away birds going crazy. They're just on the top of a knob thorn not too far away. They're sitting there and they're kind of calling and they it's almost like surround sound because I've got go-away birds behind me and I've got go-away birds in front of me. And it's not the best surround sound to be honest. They are nice to hear every now and then but not constantly for 45 minutes they start to get a little bit monotonous so a little bit too yeah <laughs> there you go that tree there <laughs> so you can see the three of them sitting on top and they are aptly named gray go away bird one because they're gray and two because of the call that they make there we go listen go away. <laughs> they're shouting at everyone to go away I'm sorry are we disturbing your afternoon no oh, excellent so we didn't get a response which is a good thing oh no we did so maybe I was just jumped the gun they were deciding whether or not we were disturbing them I feel like it's more the lions that are disturbing them than us and eventually they'll get bored of this and fly away but I don't see any sign of an owl or anything like that so it must be our carpet of lions that's lying under the gory tree causing it but it is starting to get much cooler the temperature is starting to change now it's actually very pleasant now and the sun is starting to dip down towards the horizon so we're getting to that time of the day that the lions might start getting active but I can't believe that Jamie is still sitting with her serval I'm absolutely envious so let's jump across to her I never thought I'd say this, but we've actually ended up with a flat cat serval sighting. I don't know if you can spot her. See if you can spot her as we slowly zoom in into the spot that she's hiding in. I wonder how many serval we've driven past. We always talk about that with leopards. I imagine the number must be somewhere in the thousands by now. Can you see it? There she is. You can just see, because she's turned her head away from us now, you can just see the backs of those gorgeous ears. Always listening. She hasn't gone asleep. Oh, she hasn't gone asleep. <laughs> That's not what I meant. She hasn't fallen asleep at all. She's resting, but she's still alert and she's still constantly listening. And she gave us close examination and then decided we actually weren't that interesting. Ali, 
Have Serval ever been mistaken for a cheater? Um... I suppose some at some point in history somebody has mistaken a serval for a cheetah. There's a, there is a huge size difference. They really are much, much smaller than a cheetah. It's a, I suppose you could mistake it for a cheetah cub, but cheetah cubs are very fluffy, so maybe not. Um, I imagine somewhere back in history the proposal was that cheetah and serval were in some way related, which they are. They're part of the cat. The, the, um, they're part of the, the cat order but they are not closely related at all. I can see where that comes from, though, especially with the, the markings on their bodies. The build, they've got those long legs as well, powerful, powerful back legs, though, of course, their tail's much, much shorter than that of a cheetah. They don't need to use their tails as a rudder in the way that cheetah do as a balancing instrument. And those massive ears are also a giveaway. But yes, I imagine somebody who's uninitiated to wild animals, perhaps unfamiliar with African animals, could easily make that mistake and think it was a cheetah cub. Now oh, she's dozing quite happily. This is a fantastic way to spend an afternoon. Ears still rotating. Sinak, this is the perfect environment for serval. They like to hide in long grass, so she would prefer the longer grassed areas. Obviously, she won't always have that option. As we get further into the dry season, she'll, and as the wildebeest come back into this area, they'll remove most of the grass, and she won't have that option. They like to have hiding places in drainage lines, so essentially river systems or creek systems where there's plenty of dense vegetation for them to hide in. They tend to stalk along there and spend their days there. But they like these open plains, and obviously anywhere where there's rodents and birds for them to hunt, and there are plenty of escape place, places for them to escape if they need to, whether it's up a tree or into a very dense bush so they can hide away. This particular serval is... Oh, I, I think it's the same one. I would love to actually get hold of screenshots of both today's sighting and the one that we had, that Manu and I had the one evening. I don't know where Taylor had that extraordinary serval sighting with the hyena. That was amazing. But it would be wonderful if it was the same one. Judy, black and white ears, very similar to most of the animals out here. And they, of course, animals tend not to speak to each other. They do, of course, they communicate vocally, but most of their communication is done visually. And having your the most important features enhanced by colouring like black and white that stands out really clearly is a way of emphasising what it is they're saying. So those ear twitches, you, you know from your pets at home, if you have cats or if you have dogs, when they have their ears flat behind them, they're not happy at all. Of course, the tail is also a very important part of their visual communication. And I think what you'll probably find is that those ears are also a great way for serval kittens to follow their mothers around as well. When she's trying to lead them through the long grass, the black and the white stands out clearly. And whilst predators, they're not, I mean, there's the old wives' tale that they, they only see in, in shades of grey and black and white. I mean, they do see colour. They do see a little bit of colour. Not as much as we do. But black and white stands out no matter what the season no matter what the environment. So that's why they have... And if you look at the, the backs of lion's ears, they're black. It's all just to enhance visual communication. Bri you say that they remind you of tiger's ears. I Well, it's this very similar movement in the way that all cats use utilize their ears, and that great range of movement, the ability to rotate their ears right backwards and obviously determine exactly what direction the sound is coming from, which most human beings have lost the ability to do. Some people still have that residual ear twitch. I can't do it. And Manu, can you twitch your ears? No, not, anymore. Not, not anymore. You could twitch your ears. When I was younger. <laughs> Manu says when he was younger he could twitch his ears. I can't, but some people can. A residual link back to when we were able to move our ears around. But yes, I know exactly what you're saying. And you'll find with... 
all cats. The body language is very similar. If you if you have cats at home or if you know cats, you can read, you can translate a lot of what you've learned from your pets onto wild animals. Obviously not always completely the same, but very, very similar in the way that they they use their ears, whether it's to listen or whether it's to communicate. At the moment, she's just resting, she's making sure that nothing's sneaking up on her. I know there's a there's a leopardess, a female leopard that lives around here. I, I haven't seen her, but I found a lot of her kills. And Viam and James saw her one evening. So that would be something that she'd be listening out for. Hyenas, lions, and of course the rustle of a rodent. And I think the fact that she's been as mobile as she has been today has been largely because it's quite cool and cloudy. They are, they're active during the day and at night, so they, they're active at both times of, of the day. They're not strictly nocturnal, but I'm sure you'll find that they're more active on cloudy days. And in fact, the howling wind that we had earlier would probably have helped her as well. She's taking advantage of it. I think it's going to be fascinating to sit with her, so even though she's a little bit sleepy now, we're not going to move an inch, and I imagine that Tristan has very similar ideas back in South Africa. Well, I do, Jamie. I've been watching these lions, and they have their paws in the air, so I thought, well, let me see what it's like to have my legs in the air and to lie back and enjoy the sunshine. I can tell you it's quite comfortable, except that the Land Rover is a little bit squished for me at the moment. It's not quite that comfortable because of the steering wheel. I'm trying to find the best possible way that I can sit to be like the lions, but definitely the paws in the air has got something to it, and I think I shall try it more often. I would imagine it would be better without shoes on, but, well, we can't have no shoes on while we're driving because that will just look ridiculous, but it's quite comfortable. I must say, so we'll take a leaf out of the lion's book. Seb, have you tried this before? Yeah, I've got my spot at the back. You've yeah. got your spot at the back, so Seb's also yeah. given it a bash. <laughs> of course, it's not great if an elephant came bounding out at us, we would have a bit of a trouble, and I think my back might break if I stay like that. So I'm going to have to do a bit of contortionism work to get my leg back in the car. There we go, that's better. So you can see our lions are still fast asleep, and this is what happens when you watch lions while they're sleeping, is you start thinking of all kinds of random things, particularly like your legs being up in the air and all kinds of other things, but I think it would work. You definitely catch more of a breeze with the legs than them being down in the footwell of a car that's for sure so I'd imagine they're on to the right idea but if shade would also help as opposed to being in the Sun but the pride itself is just flat and sleepy as ever they obviously had a hot day and it's all about just resting and you can see a lot of them are lying with their back legs open and they do this just to try and help cool themselves down as much as possible so open that stomach out get a bit of a breeze over the tummy between the back legs and that all just helps with the cooling nature as well as just to get a bit of airflow through those sections. You can see that female is sporting a new fashion as well. She's got the leaf look is what I like to call it. It's when you don a leaf and I don't know if it's the in thing with lions these days but she's got the leaf on the cheek. Maybe it's something like a piercing in the lion world. Who knows? You can see a little bit of sun hitting there, glinting on the leaf itself. Maybe that's the look she was going for, is waiting for that little patch of sun to hit it to show it off. <laughs> it just shows you how sleepy they are for the fact that there's a leaf that's fallen onto her face and she hasn't even wiggled it off just gives you an idea of how tired our kitties are at the moment but they will wake up they will start to get up shortly I'm sure Darlene you're wondering if these lions here have it more rough than the ones in the Mara uh, yes and no. I suppose not really. I mean, the Mara lions have their own challenges. They've got a lot of, of things that they've got to deal with. Remember the density of lions there is high. So they, from what I can gather, bump into each other every now and then. They've also got a lot of external things. So poaching is a big problem. There's a lot of human wildlife conflict on the borders of the Mara area. So the lions there have a bit of that to worry about. Um, but in terms of food items, when the migration is there, most definitely the Mara lions have it way easier than what the Sabi Sands lions do. The Sabi Sands lions, especially these in Kuma Pride, you know, they they thrive on buffalo. That's what they want and what they need to get. And we've seen there's very few buffalo this year. For the first time in my entire career, this is the least amount of buffalo that I've ever seen in this section in the last 
couple of years so it really is desperate times and the Lions have had to then rely on a lot of smaller things so they're having to go after impalas and zebras and wildebeest and they're not really geared for that they, they're not taught that as cubs and it's foreign to them to be hunting those fleeter footed individuals and that's why they've probably struggled a little bit more than if we had had a lot of buffalo around so this year in particular the Mara lions must have had it much easier over the last few months but then come the summer months and those wildebeest disappear and they go down towards the serengeti well i'm talking about our summer months so you know december january february march they disappeared to go and carve down in the serengeti and then you'll find that those lions they also have it tough they're going to have to try and find food it doesn't come as easily but there seems to be a lot more prey animals that are in the lion spectrum than they are here. Here it seems a lot more in the sort of leopard spectrum of, of antelope species that we get because they can hunt elant, they can hunt buffalo, wildebeest, zebra, giraffe, all kinds of topi. So they've got a lot of different antelope that they can go after and hunt. So I think our Inkahuma Pride has had a really tough winter season. It's normally a time of plenty, but this year has been a lot harder. Now talking of lions and the Mara lions, let's jump across to Brent and see how his lions are doing. Well, I'm a long way from where you last saw me and we're with different lions and there's quite an interesting story happening here. This uh, looks to me to be the Purungat sub-adults. Two young males, two young females and they are very very hungry and there's not an adult lioness in sight. So I wonder what's happened. Of course there's been quite a bit of turmoil uh, with the Purungat pride recently with uh, one of the notch boys dying. So has there been a takeover? Have they run to the side of the river to avoid the new marauding males? And uh, they are looking very very hungry. Shame guys. But luckily for them there are some wildebeest and zebra around. Not massive herds but a couple of thousand. So 